So, hello, friends. So, I'll just be covering very briefly on the physiology aspects of COPD ventilation. So, this topic was covered in detail in another video uh, with COPD ventilation, and there was then a separate video on NIV. So, in this particular thing, there were two concepts which I just want to touch the time constant, which I had not deliberated in the previous uh, ventilation video, and the Pride's waterfall uh, sort of a hypothesis. Uh, so, these are the two things I wanted to touch so that it completes the whole understanding of COPD ventilation and physiology. So, thank my colleague uh, Pradeep uh, who helped me develop this content. So, we have looked at this uh, picture. So, in any ventilation, our whole effort is to get the oxygen in into the lungs and get the carbon dioxide out completely. So, this is the whole hypothesis for our understanding of uh, patients when we put them on mechanical ventilator. And this I keep showing in every video. So the whole quintessence of understanding mechanical ventilation rests in this understanding of airflow dynamics. So the, your airway pressure is dependent on the flow and resistance in the airway along with volume and volume or the compliance with intrinsic tip that keeps the alveoli open. So the airway pressure is flowing to resistance plus volume divided by compliance plus tip. So this is the sort of the physiological understanding as to the determinants of airflow within the alveoli, where your airway pressure is dependent on the flow. Flow is something that we can set, but the resistance is dependent on the intrinsic nature of the airways. That resistance is normal or it can be high in asthma, COPD and other conditions. And volume is something we can set. And compliance again is uh, not something that is influenced by you. It is determined by the intrinsic nature of the lung where compliance can be reduced in where parenchyma is affected like ARDS, pneumonia, on and so forth or pulmonary edema. But compliance can be increased in conditions like COPD. And PEEP is the intrinsic PEEP that alveoli has to keep the alveoli open and this is also something that we can set. So when you look anatomically as to what really happens in the COPD, so this is the normal airway. As you see, the terminal airways are nicely open and the alveoli are distended here. But if you look at the COPD, the terminal airways are completely narrowed or compressed and there is flow limitation in the terminal airways. And if you see the alveoli the structure or uh, the morphology also is distorted. So there is a, a loss of elastic nature of this alveoli. So which I'll show you in the next. So what really happens in COPD is the whole alveolar structure gets distorted and the elastic recoil which is needed to, uh, to get the carbon dioxide out or uh, for the which is the determinant of resistance. So the elastic recoil is lost in COPD and there is narrowing of the terminal airways which I showed in the previous figure. So there is a narrowing of the terminal airways uh, for filling the oxygen within the lung and getting the carbon dioxide out. And there is narrowing of the airways. And as I said, there is destruction of the alveolar support. So the whole morphology and the alveolar uh, support sort of a structure gets distorted in COPD. Along with this, uh, there is um, smooth muscle contraction that can happen in COPD that you would that would typically explain severe bronchospasm that happens in asthma or COPD. So there is uh, smooth muscles which tend to go into some uh, spasm and there is a contraction of this and there can be a lot of uh, and the whole uh, the vicious effect of all these changes is there is a lot of inflammatory changes also that happens in COPD and there is a lot of phlegm accumulation or mucus accumulation because there is narrowing of the airways there is loss of the elastic recoil and the morphology gets distorted there is bronchospasm that is happening with smooth muscle contraction all in all leads to accumulation or clogging of lot of mucociliary secretions. And that's why we see in COPD the sort of secretion. So all this becomes a vicious conundrum, one leading on to another. So this typically happens in pathophysiologically in COPD. So when you look from the physiological standpoint, at the end of inspiration, as you see, the air gets filled. So as you see, this is the airway which is distorted or narrowed. So, during inspiration, the air goes in easily into the alveolar. But the whole problem in COPD, as we all understand, lies with the expiratory flow 
where expiration does not happen effectively. So this, this, if you look at as an expiration phase, as you see, the normal alveoli gets the, the expiration happens normally, but in the flow limited alveoli, you see there is no full expiration or exhalation of the carbon dioxide and the intrinsic peak tends to increase. So you have the pressure within the alveoli which increases in a flow limited state because of all the reasons I mentioned, the narrowing of alveoli, loss of electric recoil, inflammation, mucus accumulation, and distortion of the alveoli. All this leads to flow limitation where the expelling of this carbon dioxide does not happen and there is a perpetuating increase of this intrinsic peak that happens. So now coming to understanding of time constant. So what do we understand by time constant in patients who is mechanically ventilated? So time constant is simply equal to resistance into compliance. So figuratively, if you have to understand in a conceptual way, so it is the time taken for the alveoli to fill up and for the alveoli to empty. So that is the time in, taken for the alveoli to fill up with oxygen and for the carbon dioxide to come out is called as time constant. And from the formula, if you see, if the resistance increases, which tends to increase in COPD, time constant increases. And as I said, in COPD, compliance can be normal or high. So if you take as compliance being high, the time constant also becomes longer. So this is the correlation we need to understand. So for example, if your compliance is 0.1 centimeter per water, and if your resistance is 5 centimeter, your time constant is 0.5 second. But if you have a over distended alveoli with an intrinsic peak, so here compliance is increased to 0.15 and your resistance is increased to 20 centimeter. So your time constant increases to 3 seconds. So there is much longer time that is needed for the expelling of the carbon dioxide. So this is in simply the understanding of time constant. You have various formulas to calculate this, but in any ventilator, ICU standard ventilator, you would see this time constant, which is reflecting on the monitor when you look at the values, which is auto-populated based on the resistance and compliance. So what do we understand by dynamic hyperinflation, which are covered in the previous video? So this is a volume time, as you see, there is inadequate emptying of the volume from the lung. So this is a normal lung. The blue one is the normal lung where there is complete empty of the lung volume. That's why you do not see increase in the end expressive lung volume. So this is in COPD. You see there is inadequate emptying of the volume and there is a cumulative increase in the end expiratory lung volume. So this typically happens in COPD. So this is just another figuratively which shows inadequate ex uh, expiration of the volume leading to increase in the end expiratory lung volume. So the factors that accentuate dynamic hyperinflation, which we have very extensively covered in the previous video, is where you have higher tidal volume, higher respiratory rate, because here there is already worsening of end expiratory lung volume. And if you increase the tidal volume, there is more accumulation of this volume, lung volume leading to dynamic hyperinflation. And increase in the respiratory rate leads to shortening of the expiratory time that leads to worsening of dynamic hyperinflation or short expiratory time. So the solution for this in any COPD patient, that's why we keep tidal volume lower, we keep respiratory rate lower and we increase the expiratory time, which we have extensively deliberated. So if you look at this flow time, so the previous thing saw the volume time. If you look at the flow time, so this is the expiratory limb. As you see, it does not touch the baseline. And before it touches the baseline, the second breath starts. And this leads to worsening of dynamic hyperinflation. If you see this pattern, it is due to the airway narrowing and increase in the airway resistance. And you may see pattern like this where your respiratory time is very short. Even before the expression is stopping, the inspiration has begun. So this pattern you see in short expiratory time. And this is due to increased airway resistance. There can be bronchospasm which is not allowing for the expiration to empty. Uh, so these are some of the patterns which will be shown in exams and you may have to recognize that this is due to bronchial pattern, this is due to short expiratory time, so on and so forth. And this is the flow volume loop. Again, as you see, the volume is not touching the baseline. So all these patterns, you can look into your ventilator in any patients with COPD and active bronchospasm and you can see these sort of a patterns and these are typically shown in exams for all the trainees to recognize what this pattern is. So now we'll just move to how do we measure intrinsic peak. 
So as I said, the intrinsic PEEP is something uh, where there is a flow limited state, there is incomplete expelling of the carbon dioxide. So we put an end expiratory hold for two to three seconds. And then this is a flow time. As you see, you can measure the intrinsic peak, but all the ventilators, once you put an end expiratory hold, it will give you intrinsic peak, which is auto-populated or calculated and shows you on the monitor. So what we need to understand is how much peak we keep for a patient. So the first aspect I wanted to cover in this video is time constant. Second concept I wanted to touch about is what is the ideal peak we should keep in patients who have dynamic hyperinflation. So that for that, we need to have an understanding because our whole problem is in expiration. So in end expiration, if there is no intrinsic peak and if there is no extrinsic peak, there is something called gradient. So the gradient is zero, which means there is absolutely no problem with air going in and coming out. But if you have in only intrinsic peak of 10 and then you have extrinsic peak zero, so then the gradient is high. So which may not be very ideal for smooth expelling of the gases from the alveoli and this may not be the ideal sort of a situation we have. Then you have an intrinsic peak of 10, then you have an extrinsic peak of 8. So then the gradient becomes 2, which possibly may be the ideal situation where gases enter in easily and come out easily. So this is so the the the, the hypothesis or the concept which we need to drive home is it is the gradient that is important for uh, flow of the gases to happen smoothly. So the lesser the gradient, better it is. If the gradient is more, then there may be increase in the resistance or there may be problems in getting the gases in and gases out. So for this, this has been conceptually explained or hypothesized by Pride's waterfall. So if you take this as a uh, airway, so in any waterfall, as you see, there is some sort of a constant pressure. But once it reaches critical sort of a stage, there will be a sudden drop in the pressure. And this, this is what typically happens even in the airway. So there is some sort of a pressure which is maintaining the flow of air. And when there is sudden drop in the pressure, then there will be a sudden sort of a limitation in the flow air flow pattern. So this is explained as Pride's waterfall concept. So the easiest way to understand is this in a schematic way or figuratively, which I put it up. So this is called upstream segment where water is flowing and suddenly when you lose the resistance, there is a drop in the pressure. This is called the downstream pattern. So here in the upstream segment, if you have an intrinsic peep of 10, which is alveoli, you have an intrinsic peep, there is a dynamic hyperinflation. And if you have put extrinsic peep as zero, where you have not put any peep, which is the downstream. So it typically behaves like a water, waterfall, Pride's waterfall where there is a sudden drop in the pressure. So in the airway, there is intrinsic peep here, so where alveoli are descended, then there is a sudden downstream effect which leads to collapse of the airway. So which means there is airflow limitation gets accentuated where your extrinsic peep is zero. So this is what we need to explain why extrinsic peep of zero may not be desirable because of this waterfall effect that you would witness. Then we look into the second concept where you have put an intrinsic peep of 10 and then extrinsic peep of 10, so which is equal. So if you see here, there is no sudden drop in the pressure here. There will be a blip, but there won't be a sudden drop. So, uh, so this is an upstream where you have an intrinsic peep and you have matched with extrinsic and the gradient becomes zero. So there is a smooth flow of gases. But what if you say, I put more peep, suppose the intrinsic peep is 10, you put 12, so then what the, what happens is figuratively, if you see, if you put intrinsic PP is 12, so ideally in any COPD, we want intrinsic PP less than 10. So if it is more, more than 10, and you, you also keep extrinsic PP more than 10, then there is the over distension of the alveoli, which leads to barotrauma. So, so what happens alveoli? So basically there will be some blip and there will be over distension of alveoli, which leads to problems and uh, other hemodynamic compromise. So our whole understanding from this Pride's waterfall is in patients with COPD, if intrinsic PEEP, we should try to keep less than 10. Even if it is more than 10 or the extrinsic PEEP should be, what we have agreed upon is to keep around three-fourths of the intrinsic PEEP. Suppose if it is 10, you can keep at 8. If it is at 12, keep at three-fourths of it. 
is seems to be ideal for facilitating air flow because anything too below will limit the air flow or too above can lead to barotrauma. So this is our understanding of Bright's waterfall. So this video is all about to introduce the concept of time constant and Bright's waterfall in what sort of a peep is safe in dynamic hyperinflation. So two thirds of the intrinsic peep is considered as safe because we would somewhere achieve this sort of air flow. We don't want to be in this where you keep peep zero, there is a complete air flow limitation because of the waterfall concept, there is a drop in pressure. And you want you don't want this situation where there can be over distension of alveoli. So that's about the whole physiological understanding. So I've covered the all the physiological aspects of uh, ventilation in NIV and invasive mechanical ventilation. This video is specifically to address the time constant and the price waterfall effect. So thank you one and all. So you can visit my website www.dogsparigramapa.com to rehear this lecture.